Sharon. Yes, yes, sir. Good morning, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, good, good. Just wanted to let you know I'm here. It's good to see you bright and early. <laughs> I don't want to let you know I'm here. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs>
Good morning and welcome to Together We Can Day 3. Thank you guys for joining us. This session starts at 8.30, so we'll be starting soon. If you have any questions or comments, you can post them in the chat box. My name's Sharon. If you have any tech issues, you can send me a message in the chat box and I'll try to help you out. See you guys soon. Good morning and welcome everybody who's already here. Welcome to day three 
of the Together We Can conference. This session starts at 8.30. If you guys have any questions or comments, you can post them in the chat box. Oh, I was talking to myself and I wasn't muted. <laughs> Welcome to the sharing sessions. Hey, Jarvis, do you want to do a mic check? Yes, it works. I hear you. Loud and clear. <laughs> All right. Just checking. <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Together We Can Day 3. You guys are in the room for session 804. Past, present, the future of child welfare systems change. Welcome. 
we have a couple minutes before we get started. Anybody um, wants, has any questions or comments, you can post them in the chat box. If you're having any tech issues, you can send me a chat. My name's Sharon. I'll try to help you out with that tech stuff. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the third day of Together We Can, first virtual conference, but this is our 18th year of providing education, knowledge to people involved in the child welfare system in the state of Louisiana. We're gonna um, get started in just a minute. I'm Sharon, I'll be your Zoom room host. If you guys have any tech issues, just send me a comment in the chat box and I'll see what I can do to help you out. Thank you. Uh, All right. Sharon just sent it to me as well. I believe. My, I believe, oh, I believe Sharon just sent it. This session is scheduled from 8.30 and, and to 9.45 a.m. It is session uh, past to present, the future of child welfare systems change. If you guys have any questions or comments as the session is going along, just post them in the chat box. We'll have time for questions at the end of the presentation. And you are in session all handouts associated with the sessions for Together We Can are posted on the latwc.org website. I'm going to turn the session over to your presenters, Dr. Nathaniel Williams and Jarvis Spearman. Sharon and Jarvis. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Sharon, are we ready to go? I Whenever you, I was just unmute myself. Whenever you guys are ready. Good. Sure. Uh, Jarvis, um, why, don't we, we, why don't we go ahead and um, get started uh, with introductions? Okay. Uh, do you want to go first, uh, Jarvis? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, so good morning to all who are part of our session. Um, my name is Jarvis Spearman. Um, I am a former foster youth. Uh, I grew up in the system for 13 years. Um, I currently just graduated with my master's in social work. 
So, um, and I've been working within the field for the last six and a half years, working with youth that are in the system um, and advocating for the rights of youth that are in the system. And so that's been mainly all the work I have been doing. So it's been exciting, challenging, rough, but it's been very beneficial. Um, and that's really all about me. Good, thanks for sharing, Jarvis. Um, uh, this is Nat Williams. Um, I also um, was in the foster care system for uh, uh, 13 years. Uh, went in when I was uh, five years old and stayed until I was 18. Uh, my mother uh, died of a cranial aneurysm. Uh, she had um, uh, 12 children. Uh, 10 of them were uh, uh, necessary to go into the uh, foster care system upon her death. The other two were old enough and on their own. Um, and uh, went into a foster home um, and stayed there for about six years. Uh, and then my brother and I went for a uh, annual physical and they found uh, bruises on him uh, that I knew nothing about and uh, uh, then uh, decided to remove him, but then came out and asked me if I wanted to stay because there were no bruises on me. And I, don't, I wasn't too bright, but I, was bright enough to know that uh, they had bruises on him. I wasn't staying, uh, so <laughs> I uh, I moved on. Uh, went to another, a couple more foster homes. I then ended up going to group homes and RTFs, and then eventually uh, off to independent living. Uh, then eventually uh, I started working in the human service system, um, and uh, have been in the system ever since. Uh, I uh, started uh, a series of nonprofits um, and have been a CEO for the last uh, 30 years um, uh, here in uh, Pennsylvania. I originally started out in, uh, in New York in uh, their foster care system. Uh, that's a little bit about uh, Jarvis and, uh, and my uh, background. Uh, we wanted to talk with you today about um, uh, the future of child welfare and some of the system changes that um, we'd like to suggest um, that the system consider. Um, and we thought it would be best to try to break it down uh, based on a whole, um, a whole a child or family community system model um, that uh, we have used um, for the last uh, 20 years or so uh, that has worked uh, pretty well for us, uh, that it seems to cover all the different aspects of a person, a community, a system, and a family. Um, to make sure that all the bases are covered. And so we also wanted to give you uh, something as a participant in this workshop, something to take back uh, that you may wanna consider as a tool uh, to uh, use as you do case planning and having conversations uh, with others to make sure that the, uh, the, the, all the bases are covered. Um, so uh, on the uh, next uh, slide, uh, Jarvis and I uh, began making some notes um, on uh, some of the areas, and I know it's a little hard to see, so we'll, we'll narrate it. Um, some of the things that we thought would be helpful, um, believe it or not, uh, Jarvis is a little bit, a little bit younger than I am. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm 55, and I think Jarvis, how old are you, sir? 26. Okay, yeah, so uh, just a tad. Um, just so, a tad. Just um, a tad. <laughs> and so uh, the purpose, I think, of this workshop was just to talk about um, uh, the different perspectives as a person who's not so long ago left the system and as a person who's left the system a long, long time ago, um, and some of the observations and thoughts and feelings um, uh, about what is necessary as we look at the system. So the first system we wanted to talk about was personal development, and I'll let Jarvis begin with some of his ideas about what is needed to help kids uh, develop into the best person that they can be. Okay, um, so when we look at personal development, I, you know, in my years of education and experience, I always relay all of my knowledge and information back to the Maslow hierarchy of needs. And so with that, we know that the first thing, you know, is sex, sex um, self actualization. And so that is just really important because this is just, allowing youth um, to know their full potential. Like when foster youth come into the system, like, well, I know for me personally, I'm gonna speak on my, my personal experience. Um, coming into the system, I just really felt 
very out of place. Um, I felt very different than my peers. Um, and I just heard so much about the system and the statistics that came with the system of youth when they get ready to age out. And I just started thinking, like, am I going to ever get to live up to my full potential with you know, being moving around so much from foster home to foster home, getting a little piece of every foster family that I touch. And even like in like for me in college, like I was in the midst of like getting ready to graduate. Like I was in the middle of my sophomore year and I was like, I don't even know who I am. I don't know who Jarvis is. The only thing I know is who everyone wants Jarvis to be. And so I had to really go on a journey of discovering like, what is it that I want for my life? I understand that, you know, a lot of these people want me to be this and be that and I'll be great in this. And so I had to start self act, you know, self reflecting on myself and realizing that, you know, this is my life and, you know, I get to choose that path, you know, without like, you know, even though a lot of people recommended this and that, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, but then I had to go on that journey, that self-discovery journey for myself. And so when, you know, so that's that aspect of it. And then we go to, you know, other needs, like being creative. Like for me, I grew up, I, a lot of false homes I were in, they were very sports. They were all about sports. And I was, just, I was not into sports. I was into like the arts, cooking, drawing, music. That was me. And a lot of foster parents didn't really know how to relate to that. So they were, no, they didn't really support it as much. So I had to learn how to support myself in that area. So if you are working with kids or, you know, you're a foster parent or a caseworker, like you have to be aware of that there are different many, there are so many various amount of things that kids can be, you know, creative in or their creativity might spike in. It may not always be sports or, you know, it might be something that is totally different or off the wall, you know, but sometimes you have to support kids in their own creative ways of figuring themselves out and figuring out where they place themselves in life. Um, and then cognitively, like this is just knowledge and understanding, like just allowing the, allow youth um, to be able to think for themselves and to learn to understand things on their own. Like, you know, a lot of foster parents, they didn't want me to make mistakes. And I'm just like, you know, that's a part of life. Like, you know, I have to mess up. I have to bump my head in order to learn. You know, I can't, you know, always do everything right because we're not perfect. And so just, you know, when they make mistakes, allow them to learn from that, allow them to live through their mistake. And one thing I'm a fan of not doing is saving people from mistakes. Like, if we are always saving people from mistakes, they never learn that whole process of what a mistake is. And when you always snatch them out before the end, like they never fully understand. So I allow people to go through mistakes and then we have a discussion. But, you know, saving them all the time is just not it's not the healthiest way to for them to learn, because I always tell people like. Like my brother, I take out custody of him, like and I used to save him all the time from mistakes. And I had to start realizing if if something happens to me and I now I have always saved him, what have he really learned? You know, besides, oh, well, I know if I mess up, somebody's going to save me. And, you know, I had to realize for myself that, you know, growing up in the system before turning 18, I had to realize I don't really have the family structure and the family support like a lot of my friends do. They have a very big family that's very supportive. And I really don't have that. So I had to grow up really fast. and I had to start thinking like, if no one is here to save me, then what happens? I have to learn how to do that for myself. So I had to learn how to make mistakes, get out of mistakes and work on ways around not making that same mistake again. And so we have to be aware of that. Um, and then self-esteem and res respect, family and friends, like that all plays a part into their esteem needs. Like um, growing up for me, in the system, I had very low self-esteem. Like, I felt like I was never a part of a family. Like, I was a part of a family when I needed to be, and then all the rest of the times, I wasn't a part. Like, I will remember, like, some foster parents would take us out, and they was like, oh, these are my little foster children. And I'm just like, dang, like, now everybody's in my business. <laughs> and so, and it just made me feel so different, like, and outside of the way that I was already feeling. Like, I already felt you know, different because I was in a situation that I couldn't control. And so it was it was hard to, 
navigate around it. And so, it, you know, we just have to be aware of like how we are introducing foster kids and how we are doing that because we already are feeling different. We already feel weird to even be in the situation that we're in. So just always be aware of that. Um, and then loving them belonging. Like, even though we are in a system, like we still crave loving and belonging. We want to be accepted fully. Like some foster families, like they take you in and they care for you, like food, water and all that, the basic stuff. But then where's the support? Where's the love, the genuineness? Like that is pieces that goes into, you know, building a person up and really supporting them truly. So we have to be aware of, you know, not only supporting them with the basics, but supporting them with the eternal needs that they need as well. Um, And then safety needs, staying away from, that's just being, staying away from dangerous situations. Like, and sometimes being in some homes were very, they were dangerous themselves. And so um, it, it's, you have to be aware of like what's happening in the child's life and what's happening in that youth's life. And then workers, this is definitely for you guys, be aware of what's happening in the home with these children. Because I, like I tell people, my trauma didn't come from being at home. It came from being in the system. Like that's where a lot of the trauma that I'm still trying to overcome. I'm still going to therapy for trying to get past. It came from being in the system, not from my home life. And Jarvis, hmm? can I ask you just for a second to um, unpackage that a a little bit, just for all of us to understand what you mean by that? So what, what brought you into the system that, if you don't mind sharing, as compared to what you experienced while you were in the system? Um, yes. So abuse, it was more like neglect. So that was, that was the main thing. And, but what I did love that my mom did was she prepared, like when she knew she was about to spiral, she made sure that we had a place to go. She made sure that we had money and food. Um, we, she made sure that I had my games and my toys. So like she, you know, stayed aware of herself and she knew how to navigate around her illness. And, you know, she made sure that he was okay. And then eventually that kind of, I guess that caught up, you know, to her and, you know, we finally were taken. And so that was what brought me into the system. Okay. And you said that um, what you experienced while in the system was possibly more traumatic. Yes. Um, yes. The living in the system was very difficult um, with some foster families. And I'll never forget the worst foster family ever was living with a preacher family. And so I'm not sure, you know, there's any people that are, that know about that, but you, when you're a preacher's child, you have to be. (laughs) You're talking in Louisiana and you're asking if there possibly could be some religious people. Really? Yes. Yes. (laughs) Or there there are. Yes. And it was so hard because like we had to be perfect make the perfect grades we have to get up in church and recite speeches without reading the paper like it was very hard and what the hardest thing about it was they cut us off from social life so I was not we weren't allowed to have friends we were allowed to have friends but we was not allowed to call them wasn't allowed to go to their house so if it was church home school and work and that was it. Like there was no other social life. We didn't even watch TV. So I would be at school with my peers and they're talking about things that they seen on TV or the cartoons. And I'm just like, what is that? Like we, we only watch TV like four times out of the year. Other than that, we're working like, you know, and I just said, I was like, we worked like slaves because that's what we did. Like every, it was like always work in church and that was it. And then, you know, and then the most traumatic things that happened was like, we also got beat a lot in that home. They starved us and everything. And like my direction to the workers was, you have to be aware of what's happening in the home. Like this family was always under investigation for always some type of abuse. And they just got closed down not too long ago, like a couple of years ago. And so it's just like, 
I understand that we need foster homes and we need placements, but we have to be aware of like what's happening. If a family is always under the same investigation, then there needs there is some type of truth in that. But I never forget this lady came out to do an investigation. We was all in the living room and that false that caseworker was like, oh, well, y'all probably deserve it. And so after that, I stayed in that home for like two and a half years after that and dealt with that trauma. And I was just like, you know, I had to really tell myself, I know God's going to bring me out of this one day. And 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 so I'm just I just dealt with it because I was always fearful of if I leave this home, I can go somewhere it's worse. So I'm just going to take this abuse and I'm just going to try to be strong as much as I can for my younger siblings that are looking up to me. And so I had to navigate through that pain and through that trial and that era because and it was hard. Like and a lot of my trauma of being perfect when I mess up, being super hard on myself comes from being in that home, because when we messed up or made mistakes, we got beat for that. And and I never forget just going. I never forget going to school a lot of times not being able to sit down because I have whips all over my back. And, you know, and then this one worker, she finally understood and she finally believed what I said. And we finally got an adoption that had she sped it up, you know, because it was hard. It was very hard living there. But and that's why I say workers just always be aware. And to workers like I understand like caseloads be super extreme, but try to check in with with your with some of your kids, you know, because one time a month is just not it's not it's not doable. Like because in between those months, like there's a lot of stuff that goes on um, and things that can be called or things that could be investigated. And, you know, it was just once a month. Like I was just like, yeah, I, all this stuff is happening in between the months that y'all come. And so it's just like we just have to be aware of like what is happening with our youth and our caseload of youth that we have. And um, yeah, and it was it was it was extreme. Um, but. And and that's why I say my trauma really came from the system. It didn't come from home. Like at home, I knew I grew up in a poor environment. So I already kind of had the mindset of, OK, this can either go two ways. I can either make it out or I can become a product of my environment. And my thing was I was super smart and my aim was to always make it out and to be the best that I can be. And so but then getting placed in the system like that's when all of my trauma happened. And so. I'm still overcoming a lot of the things that happen in the system. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I have about personal development. And um, uh, please, uh, please note, uh, Jarvis, some of the things that are being uh, shared in the chat, which is uh, one of them is an apology. I think uh, several of them are apologies and uh, somewhat of a shock and dismay that that's um, what you experience because we're, we're, we're supposed to do better than that. Um, so please um, accept the sentiment um, and the apology on behalf of the other people uh, that are here. And one of the things that I um, uh, had asked um, for those of people that feel comfortable is to open your cameras. I think that as we're trying to establish a sense of community, being able to see uh, who we're talking to and, and sharing this information with, with would be helpful. So for those of you that are able to, um, I know some of you may be in situations where it may not be conducive to do so, but we would encourage you to do that. But thank you, Jarvis, for uh, for sharing that. And under the grid that we have on the screen that's available as a PowerPoint link um, as a handout, I think both Jarvis and I agree that giving the kids life skills training and preparing them for the future um, as they start getting into their teens is something that's critically important. Um, and I think Jarvis began talking about the spirituality part. Um, and I've even in the sessions that I attended uh, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, um, there's a lot of, um, uh, I think, good, good intentions that I'm hearing uh, from people um, about spirituality and trying to bring that uh, to the, uh, the, the foster children um, and making that available to them. Um, uh, but I think that as you heard from Jarvis, that could be a, a double-edged double -edged, sword. Um, and so the sensitivity with how to navigate that um, is, is so important. Um, and I know for a lot of the families that that's an integral part about for them that maybe enables them to do the, the, uh, the, the to serve as a resource parent and a foster parent. So again, it's a tough um, uh, circumstance to navigate, 
Um, but I think it's something that we as a system have to continue to keep talking about because often the system goes to the, uh, the spiritual community uh, for, as a resource uh, to develop families um, and to seek families. Um, so it's something we have to continue to try to figure out. And for a lot of the, the children who are coming into the system, that's one of the life domains that often is the least attended to uh, by the family. And, and often the resource family, that's the most attended to issue um, so um, uh, those issues are converging uh, against each other and uh, talk about night and day. Um, uh, that may be the biggest shock uh, that um, a, a uh, and, I, and I think for those of us uh, that believe that spirituality should be a central point, I think we would agree that we, we wouldn't want spirituality to be uh, a traumatic point uh, for, uh, for youngsters uh, in their life. Um, so let's go on to the issue of, of health. Uh, Jarvis, you want to share your thoughts about that? I think you did a little bit already. Um, but oh, um, yeah, yes. Yeah, so health, um, this, you know, well, I, you know, I wrote some notes, you know, I like to research. Uh, so health, when we're looking at health, like, I have like four different domains that health consists of. And so the first one is the physical. So that is just basically like exercise, nutrition and sleep. Um, and then you have spiritual, you know, you have spiritual health, which, you know, consists of the sense of sense and meaning and purpose of life, embracing beliefs in a healthy way and experiences. And then intellectual, this is opening up the mind interaction with the world outside of the person and learning, problem solving and processing. And then environmental, this is being surrounded by in healthy environments and also being able to connect with nature. And so when we look at physical, we um, want to be able to allow kids, I would say, you know, allow them to be able to go outside and to play, you know, and to even join organizations where they're staying active, you know, and they're running, you know, off a lot of, you know, because I know a lot of kids, they do sports. Well, a lot of my foster siblings that I had, they turned to sports to deal with a lot of anger, a lot of things that they were, that was happening. So they put that into their, their sports life. And, um, and I did music. So, and I, and I did poetry. So that was a lot of stuff that I did. You know, I had to find outlets for that. And a lot of kids do find outlets when like they're upset or they're angry, they put it into different things. Um, and then spiritual, this is just, spiritual is a big thing in the system, like still today, because some of the youth that I have worked with recently, like they always talk about that. And and I, and I we all know that we live in the Bible built, you know, and we're condemned to go to hell for everything that we do. So, but we have to be aware of like how we are putting that off on children. Um, because that foster home that I was in, like I had, I had went through a phase of like, God, like, why is this happening to me? Like, why am I having to deal with all of this? And these people are, are a preacher family. Like they supposed to be loving and kind and understanding and walking in the way of you. And I, I took off from church for a long time because I had to grow spiritually again, because I had lost a lot of hope and trust in and God at that moment, because I'm just like, why this is this is wrong, you know, and so we have to be aware of like when kids are coming into the system, be aware of spiritual routines, because people the kids are maybe coming from a world where like church is not a priority. They go to church, but it's not like, oh, I'm going to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday and do three services on Sunday. Like and I used to tell myself, I'm like, I love God. I love him so much. But I'm just, I don't know how to go to church, like, you no, know, seven times out the week. Like, that's just too much. And so, I, but, you know, we have to be aware, like, when kids are coming into our homes, like, we, un I understand that you cannot leave them there and you can't leave them at home, but be willing to, you know, work around routine. Like, if you navigate them slowly into the process, don't just throw them in, because then when you throw them in and they're not used to that, then it become a forceful thing. And then that leads to a lot of issues. And then that then, you know, we're going to claim is defined behavior because and then it's it all stems from you trying to force them into something that they really don't understand or they really 
they really haven't prioritized in their life from their home life. So we have to be aware of how we are navigating youth around that issue. Um, and then intellectual, um, you have to be able to allow youth to be in the world, like allow them to open up, allow them to learn, allow them to see different things um, and allow them to problem solve. A lot, like I was saying earlier about making mistakes, don't just snatch them out from mistakes, you know, just because like you don't want them to want them to mess up. But sometimes you have to allow people to mess up for them to learn the whole process. And I'm th and thank God, you know. Uh, you know, I explain that to my foster parents a lot. I'm like, you know, I have to, you know, I have to mess up, like, because if you're not here one day and I mess up and I'm waiting, I'm sitting around waiting on the sidewalk for you to come and save me and you like four or five hours away. So I have to figure out how to do that in the midst of that moment. And um, then processing. Um, when youth are coming into the system, like it's a whole lot of processing that's going on. And I know a lot of parents they always say, well, the child is angry, the child is angry. I mean, I mean, yeah, we probably are because we are dealing with a lot of emotions, a lot of things that is happening. And so we have to learn how to process that. And even as adults, like you, when you're going through a traumatic experience or you're going through any type of crisis, like it takes time to process. And sometimes there are some people that process things way fast, you know, and there are some people that process things way slow. So we have to be aware of like how they process things. And it may not be the same way that you process things, but we have to be able to guide them in that process, but not force that process on them either. Wow, very good. Thanks for sharing. Um, let's talk about education. And I think one of the things that uh, both uh, Jarvis and I would both agree um, is that we're very fortunate uh, that uh, that is an avenue that we pursued um, and uh, can continue to pursue. Um, uh, I met uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Sharon, uh, at the University of Southern California as I'm pursuing my doctorate in social work and we will both graduate in a couple of weeks um, uh, from uh, the program. And um, uh, I, this is my fifth uh, graduate degree and I was telling my wife that I think I want to go to law school and she says, well, I think we're going to get a divorce. So being that she said that uh, I don't think I'm going to graduate school. Um, so um, I think this is the end of my educational pursuits. Um, but I, one of the things that's uh, so sad about uh, often kids in the foster care system is that their uh, one to 3% of foster kids will go off and get a, uh, a higher credential where 30% of Americans um, will get that final degree. 50% will try, 30% will get it. And so when we have our one to 3%, um, it's really, really um, a, a very serious divide and, and a real challenge. Um, so I think it's important that it both as uh, Jarvis and I sit in front of you with all of these initials behind our name, uh, that is not, uh, as you know, a typical experience. And we'd like to work real hard to do that. One of the things that uh, happened a couple of years ago uh, is here in Pennsylvania, um, a, a Baptist Children's Services went out of business and they wanted to get out very, very quickly. And they had been in business for over 125 years and they uh, decided in April, they wanted to be out by June 30th. And so they started looking around for other providers and they came upon us and um, we had a meeting um, and um, they made the decision that they wanted to, to, to get out and, and they said, hey, here's the, the building, here are the keys, here are the mortgages, uh, there weren't any mortgages, uh, here are the deeds and we're gone. And I'm like, hold, hold on a second, I'm, I'm Catholic. Uh, I don't know if you wanna, you wanna turn over $3 million worth of programs to someone that isn't, uh, 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 isn't uh, part of your persuasion. So we got them to slow down and we ended up uh, converting uh, those assets into uh, primarily a scholarship fund. Um, uh, that uh, supports children that want to go on to higher education. Um, so we have you know, at our disposal about a quarter of a million dollars uh, available each year uh, to augment um, um, those pursuits for those youngsters. And we don't care what kind of credential it is. It doesn't have to be college. It could be a trade school. It could be a, a certification for CPR, first aid. It could be anything. And I know you all have heard of other agencies that have gone out of business. And I would just ask you if those, if that information becomes aware to you, I want you to do me a favor is go ask them, what are you doing with those assets? Where are they going? Because they should find a way back 
uh, to those children um, who they were meant to serve. And so uh, we were able to do that. And if they struggle with the concept, and we did that in 90 days. Um, so if they struggle with the concept about how to do that, um, please um, um, ask them to give me a call. I'll answer on the first frame uh, to help them to do that. Um, but I think the uh, both Jarvis and I would agree that the educational piece and or credentialing, anything that lets the world know that they take their career and their path seriously is something we need to um, encourage them uh, because that's one of the very few um, true liberators uh, for a person um, is, the, is the world of education. And, and that's the beauty of, especially when they go to a, um, a, a, a uh, a college or a university, you could be anybody there. You could be the son of a, a prince or you could be um, a person who's the first generation um, a college student. You, it's, a, it's truly a fresh start and, but the, and it's stuff that you will learn uh, that um, uh, can never be taken from you. Um, so I think both Jarvis and I would, uh, would agree that the education is, is so very important um, to uh, encourage them uh, to go as far as they possibly can, formally, informally, credentialed, um, 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 but to do that. Jarvis, anything to add there? Um, education, yes. Um, as when we look at education, and you know, I had got custody of my brother, and when he was 14, and I was 21, so you know, I was not sure how that was gonna work, but uh, I had to pray on it. Um, and so I, 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 he moved to my home at 14 and when he was getting ready to graduate, we talked about college and life after that. And, you know, for so long, like I would, I was thinking, you know, because I grew up and all I heard was education is going to get you out. Education is where it has to be. Like, that's what's going to put you up in the world. And so as I started, that was something eternal for me. And so I started putting that on, off on him. And I never forget one day we was having a conversation and he was like, I really just want to do this to make you proud. And like that just really did something to my spirit. Cause I'm just like, I don't want you to do something to make me proud. I want you to do something that makes you proud because at the end of the day, it's about you. It's not about me. Um, I'm not, I don't want to feel like I'm forcing you to do something. And, you know, and so he did it for a little while and he didn't like it. And I supported that. Um, a lot of times, you know, we, and then when it comes to education, like, like you were saying, Mr. Nathaniel, um, it's many avenues of education. And like one thing about me and like some of the peers that I see with on the board, like they refer to us as like the it kids or I don't, the three percenters. And I kind of, I don't like that, you know, because it makes, it makes other youth seem see us as like, okay, well, that's the only way to be successful or that's the only way to do this or to really be, you know, come out of a negative experience and start living a better life. But it's not. There's so many different avenues. You don't have to go to college to be successful. There are many millionaires that have not gone to college, not one day in their life. And they make a lot of money and they are well, they are living very well. So, there are many avenues, trade school, military. There are, you know, if people want to cut hair or do hair, then that's fine. Who You don't have to be a doctor in order to, to live life. Like, you know, so we have to be aware of like how we are forcing that educational component on kids as well, because it's many different avenues. Some people might just want to work and that's fine. You know, so as a as a former youth and as and as being president of a board and working a lot in advocacy like advocate work i try to re reframe that 3% thing because i'm like if we only focus in on 3% what is happening to that 97% like what is happening to them like is, are they not important as well and so i started getting away from that fact you know that that saying because we have to worry about what's happening with the rest. Like they may not all want to go to college like I did. They may not all, all want to be social workers like I did. They may not want to give back to the system like I did. So it's just like you have to learn how to navigate around their needs and their goals. And so if they want to work, join the military, do hair, you know, be a I mean, I'm just going to say be a bartender. If that's what they want to do, then you have to support them, you know, just support them. Don't just shoot down their ideas. You know, just because it doesn't make enough money in your books, but it might be 
you know, making enough, making money and being happy, those can be two different components because I can make money and not be happy, but I'd rather make money and be happy. And so we have to support them in their goals and their aspirations for their own life and not force them or have them thinking, okay, well, college is the only way out, you know, and it's not. So that's my piece on that. Good. Thanks for sharing. So I think we're going to take next the one area that I think that Jarvis and I have a little bit of a contention in, and it's the one about family and friends. So I'll, I'll start out and Jarvis will, will do cleanup. This is the one area that I have a, a, a major problem with, and it's the words that we use in our industry. Um, and we talk about permanency and we talk about forever. And if I had a magic wand, I would make those words disappear because they are words we cannot honor. And I think that the children are coming to us because they had those things already and they didn't work out. And so we're promising them again that we're going to do this and I don't think we can do that. So I think that we should use words such as intentional and such as chosen and by choice, but I, there are other words that I think are more realistic. Um, and someone wrote in the chat about stability, but to say that this is permanent and it's forever is very challenging. And I've run uh, group homes uh, for teenagers for 30 years. And some of the most challenging children we have served have been the children who have had their own family um, uh, destabilized or adopted one time. It did not go well. Adopted again, it did not go well and adopted for the third time and it didn't go well and are now 14 and are in the group home. Each time they went in front of the judge and were told this is permanency and a forever family. Um, so uh, again, we, we want to um, strive for that, but that's to me a, a godlike behavior uh, that I can't, I can't do. Um, and, and sometimes we have these situations where the, the kid's 12 and the loving person who has taken him into their home is 72. And we're saying that this is permanence and forever. I don't know how we do that mathematically. Um, and especially if they're an African-American man and statistically we're out of here by the time we're 65. So I just think often we're saying things that just don't add up. And again, I understand the intention, um, but I also think for the youngsters, and I, as I was one, I think it's a little bit disrespectful to the, to the families that we came from to say that that wasn't forever and that wasn't permanence as well. Jarvis. Yes. So <clears throat> on, on that piece, when it comes to permanency, family and friends, like I definitely understood like where Mr. Nathaniel was coming from because we, so I think a lot of times we promise things and we cannot always keep it. And so one thing I do when working with clients or just in general, like in my life, like I don't never promise. I never promise nothing. I always say I do my best and I will try because that's the reality of the situation. We promise permanency. Is that my connection or Jarvis's? Can you guys still hear him? Cannot hear him. Okay, Jarvis, do you want to try that again? Okay, he's um, gonna try to, okay, there you go. Jarvis, one more time. All right, well, we're gonna, we're gonna keep going and hopefully he'll come on back in. Um, but the other problem is that all oh. hmm. right. uh, it's an internet problem. It looks okay. like we'll be back in a minute. Very good. So
So the other areas I think that Jarvis already talked about was the issue of the environment and making sure that it's safe. Um, and I think he gave some points there about um, ways to do that. And I, I think that um, he was implying that some of these visits that we uh, as a system make, maybe they should be more unannounced and more random um, and more consistent uh, with the hours of the home's uh, uh, prime time. Um, and that, that often that prime time is uh, uh, counter to the, office, the hours of our, our office hours. Um, but that may be able to, uh, maybe an opportunity for us to see uh, more of what um, uh, is, is going on um, if we match those hours up um, with uh, the visits up with those prime time hours uh, for when the home is um, moving in a uh, in an active way. Uh, financial um, uh, that um, uh, making sure that the kids are being prepared for, for job readiness and they have skills and uh, they're uh, they're saving and uh, money and that often if they'll save money if we're going to match the money that they're giving to with some percentage. And, um, um, in, you know, in some of our cases, we do 100% match for whatever they have. And sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, less than that. But just to try to incentivize um, uh, the behavior that we're looking for in the financial domain. And I think, again, we talked about recreation. And I think Jarvis gave us a really uh, good um, understanding that there is a whole spectrum of where the kids uh, fall in um with respect to their talents and that we should allow for that spectrum to be appreciated and uh, encouraged um that often um we have a, a lot of uh, youngsters who uh, don't um, have any um interest or participation in anything extracurricular sports um um no i'm saying uh, uh let me uh someone just wrote in the chat uh, in the chat uh, Mr. Nathaniel, are you saying that uh, D DCFS, I am from Pennsylvania, so I'm not speaking on behalf of Louisiana. I uh, do not want to get Louisiana in, tr in trouble. And I'm also talking about my agency, uh, which is called Child First Services in Pennsylvania. So do not go calling Louisiana and said, I heard some from Mr. Nathaniel on Friday that you're giving money out because uh, they're, they're going to ask you, who was Mr. Nathaniel? Because we're coming after him. Um, uh, I get him. <laughs> uh, so, I, <laughs> so I'm just giving you uh, an example of what a private agency is doing in, a, in another state to try to incentivize uh, the kids uh, to do uh, some of the things that we want to do. Often they follow the money. Um, so uh, that's what we've learned to do. Uh, but again, going back to recreation, um, is just to allow for that spectrum, understanding that sometimes uh, the kids are not doing anything and whatever we could do to try to encourage them um, uh, to explore that as an, as an option would also be good. Jarvis, you were, you were cut off midstream, but you're back now. So pick up where you are. Oh, yes. Um, so where, where, I'm, where I'm filling in. Well, where were you were? If you, uh, I think we were talking uh, about- Oh yeah, perm I think I was on permanency. Right, family, right. Oh yeah, so I was just saying like, when we, I never promise something and because that's when they start, youth will start trusting you. Like if you promise that oh, this is gonna be a great home, I know it is like a lot of people say that it is. And, but when we look at permanency, like, you know, that can, like my last home was with an older lady. Like, I don't even call her foster mom. Like, I just call her grandma. And she was older. And like, to this day, like we still have a connection. I go see her every Friday. I talk to her on the phone every day. Um, and, you know, she is a permanent connection for me. And, you know, so when, you know, we look at age and all that, like, yeah, you want, teens or you might want kids that are active to be with someone that is younger and all that but you know sometimes being with older you know an older person like it it you know it helps and you know she shared you know she instilled a lot of wisdom um on in me and you know and so to this day like she's still a permanent connection for me and we didn't had a 13 years of experience with one another and you know it wasn't always easy you know because she was older I was younger, so the times were very different of how they were raised, how, you know, we've been raised in the, you know, present time. And so, you know, we had our moments, but, you know, now we're able to, if we have a disagreement, you know, we're able to see each other's viewpoints and we agree to disagree. And so and you, have a car you just have to always be aware of that. You have a car now in your own place that you can get up and get I do. And, 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 and it was crazy because like her being a permanent connection for me, like, 
she actually had a trailer in the back of, in the back of her yard, and I stayed there most of my college, my undergrad. Like she allowed me to stay there um, because I had I moved off campus because I couldn't focus on campus, and I stayed there for a while. And like when she got a new house in another area, like she allowed me to stay in the old house with my family because I had moved my family down, my biological family, like because I was going through the reunification phase, which was was difficult but you know it you know so she allowed us to stay in the house so she have always helped me in so many different ways than any other foster parent have and like to this day like we talk all the time she gives me advice if I'm ever in need of anything like she always she's always there you know to help and support me and I'm there for her too like we are there for each other we're a team and so you know when it comes to permanency, it doesn't matter if you're young or old, like anyone can be a permanent connection for a youth, you know, as long as they are, you know, instilling positivity into that youth life, then I, I don't see why not. Good, very good. So I think this is a really good time. We have about another half an hour to go before we uh, wrap up to really open it up for you uh, to um, ask us any questions, share any thoughts that are going through uh, your mind. Um, um, so uh, let's let's do that. There, there are some things that were posted in the chat that we can also respond to. Um, someone asked about that chart. Um, I posted it there and uh, Sharon also posted the PowerPoint um, from today as well. So you have it two different ways. One is a single page um, PDF and then also as part of um, the PowerPoint. Um, but please, um, let's pause and if you can open your mics up to ask us any questions, share any comments, thoughts, feelings that you have. If you guys are having a difficult time unmuting yourself, just send me a message in the chat box and I'll try to help with that. I have opened up the capacity in the room for you guys to unmute yourselves. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, I have a question about um, reunification for both yeah. of you guys so um uh, yeah like can is it helpful for all people who are in the foster care system to have that focus on reunification uh, let me go first uh, i'll be I'll okay be, i'll be short <laughs> um, because that was never ever uh ever uh an option um, because mom died when i was five dad was unknown um, and there were not um, uh, pursuits of who the father was um, because it was assumed uh, that there were there were several um, uh, and no one uh, came to the table. And part of it, I think, was the phone call uh, that they made to my mother's brothers and sisters uh, when she passed away and said uh, she has passed away and she has 10 children. Uh, do you want them all? Um, so I think that they heard a dial tone rather quickly. Um, so um, there was no one to reunify with, I think, based on uh, how the telephone call was made. Um, so um, uh, reunification was just not um, on the table uh, because there was no one uh, to, uh, to reunify with. Jarvis? Um, so I went through the reunification process for, and I was in the midst of college, uh, and it was, it was, it was very stressful. But my my thoughts around that is when it comes to reunifications, especially like with extended family or bio family, like I I'm very a uh, strong supporter of, you know, when parents rights are terminated, like I don't think or we should not cut off the bio family because me trying to reunify with my bio family after 13 years, it is the most difficult thing that I have ever did right now like at this moment in my life and so now like I just don't even know how to relate to them because I have grew up in a whole different environment and you know and so they they sometimes think that I'm I think I'm perfect or I'm better than them and sometimes I just think that they are just not you know they're pretty wild and so it's just like I think of that process you know, if I was able to stay connected with my bio family outside of my parents' rights being terminated, then the process would have been a little easier for me to navigate around because 13 years of trying to pick up where you left off, things have changed, people have changed. 
Yeah, and so it's just like it's very hard to navigate around that. And my reunification process, I had moved my mom, my little sister, and my other siblings that I grew up in foster care with all in the same house. And so I just, and then they were all at a point in their life where they were, I have always been a nurturer, like since I was a little kid, like when my mom was on drugs real bad, like I would remember, you know, picking, putting my little brother on my hip and, you know, my little sister in my hand walking to my aunt's house, you know, to get out of the environment that we were in, you know, because I didn't want them to grow up, you know, seeing anything, you know, or being in that type of environment. And so, and when the process of reunification happened, I hadn't lived, I haven't even lived with my brother and sister for a long, it was like over nine years I hadn't lived with them because we were split in the system. And then my mom, there was not like a lot of years of broken pieces and things that a lot of, you know, we had to fix a lot of things. And so they were all in a place in their lives, like where they were trying to, you know, elevate themselves and, you know, be better. And so I'm like, you know, this would be a good option, you know, because, you know, we have a whole big house, you know, where we can all stay until we all get back on our, till we get on our feet, until y'all know your next steps in life. And it was very hard because even my siblings, like when I came into the system, like my mom always told me, like, always take care of your siblings, your smallest siblings, like always look out for them no matter what. And then when we split, you know, that became very difficult. And so I wasn't able to really do that, you know, in the full capacity that I wanted to. And so moving back with them, like they were totally different people. Like I was a totally different person. They were a totally different person. And it was very hard for us to really get, we had to get to know each other all over again. Cause we was like strangers to one another because their values and the way that they have lived through foster homes was very different than how I lived. And so it was very, we always, we bumped, bumped heads a lot because like things that I saw important, they didn't, you know, so it was just a lot of things going on, but we're not together now. So what we have figured out is that we get, we get along way better if we're not under each other. And right now we're getting to know one another all over again, because being split from your siblings in the system, like that, that's a difficult process as well. And then when I turned 18, they cut off, I was cut off from connection with them. And I just was like, that's not fair, you know, because, you know, I'm their brother and we grew up in the system, so I shouldn't be cut off from my siblings. You know, I want to be there for them. But, you know, they were like, you know, where you're grown now and, you know, we don't want them to have any connection with like your mom or whoever. And I'm just like, we shouldn't do that to children. We should allow children to still connect with their family members outside of their parents' rights that are terminated because that's how they stay connected to their roots and how they stay connected to their culture. And so I'm just a firm believer of, you know, allow them to continue to have, you know, you know, visits with their extended family members because like that is something that they have to go into because when we come out of the system, we have to, a lot of times, kids, foster youth are going to navigate back to their family in some type of way of capacity, like trying to get to know them, trying to fix broken pieces. And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. And so we just have to be aware in the midst of that moment happening, always, you know, still allow them to talk to their birth, you know, their bio family, you know, outside of their parents' rights that are terminated, you know, because it'll make the reunification process so much easier, I think, in my opinion. Wow. Thanks for sharing. Any other questions, thoughts, comments, feelings? And someone mentioned that the initiative in Louisiana or QPI has helped that understanding come over the last three years. I, I've heard that over the last two days in, 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 uh, in workshops. So kudos to what you're doing in Louisiana. Any other thoughts? So, uh, can I ask a, another question? I'm sorry. Else is... So, uh, Nate, what do you see as the, the biggest change from when you describe what happened for you and when Jarvis speaks about what his experience was in the system? is coming from but um sharon asked um what do i see as the biggest change in the system well i think that's part of the problem is that i don't think the system has 
radically changed. Um, and I think that's one of our challenges is that I think we really need to uh, radically look at um, what we're doing. Um, I think that really trying to help these families um, with um, the supports and services that they need um, to fight um, uh, the best fight that they can. Um, often um, it's uh, remove um, and uh, figure it out later. And often that removal is something that can't ever be reversed. But I think it's important for us to understand that as a society, we often do that with all of our problems. Uh, we tend to hide the problem and we tend to relocate the problem. Um, I worked in the, uh, the intellectual disabilities community uh, for a long time as well. And our, we, I am a CEO for a sister agency, in addition to being the CEO for Child First, another agency called Spectrum that serves adults with intellectual disabilities and autism. Um, and that community has also suffered from the same issue is that often when people have had disabilities over the years and many years, we've tended to tell the parents um, that we know best and place your child somewhere uh, else uh, away from you. Um, and uh, so we often do that. And I remember years ago when my uh, uh, brother, um, one of my older brothers uh, uh, had, uh, was HIV positive and then got AIDS and, um, and how that was handled. And we, we do this with any um, uh, circumstance, uh, we tend to uh, uh, put them away. Um, and uh, so I think it's just something we have to learn, um, not only in the child welfare system, um, but in every system that we're, we're trying to help is to confront the problem uh, head on um, and understand um, as, we, as best we can uh, to keep um, uh, the uh, people uh, as close to their community. We tend to always um, come back to that. <laughs> um, you see that in, in, in healthcare, that as people get older, we, want to, we put them in a nursing home and then we realize, oh my Lord, they really need to go back to their family, their, to their home. And, um, but we, we always end up doing that. Um, and the question is, could we cut to the chase in all of these systems and recognize there's nothing like a person's home, there's nothing like a person's community. And please, I am not, uh, I don't wanna appear to be naive that there are some circumstances uh, where there is pure neglect and there's abuse. Um, uh, but I think the, also the beauty of, of, of today's technology is these families uh, are humongous. And with uh, family finding, it, there, there is someone uh, out there. Um, so, and also let's just do the math. Uh, there are about 400,000 children here today. There are 13 million former foster people living in the United States of America today. 13 million former foster people living in the United States of America today. 400,000 present foster kids, 600 to 700 cycle in and out in a year's time. If we just did something better for the 13 million who go into the system and come out and did something to help them come back and take care of people that will follow in their footsteps, this problem would be over. And then some. So I, I really think that if we're really committed to solving the problem, so again, I, I would wanna support the families and do everything we can, but there's others that are, whether it's their family, whether it's others that have been in their footsteps. I, I saw an article just recently where a guy in Florida um, had, had some of the siblings, um, but they wanted to keep all five of them together. And so he was the only foster parent as a single man that would be willing to keep all five together. So he got all five. But you know why that's a story? because it isn't a story. It isn't an everyday story. That's why it stands out. And that's the problem. It needs to be an everyday story. So when we see it in the newspaper, it's because it's not happening. It couldn't happen, it wouldn't happen. And often people believe it shouldn't happen. That's why it's in the newspaper. That's what you're watching on television, stuff that shouldn't, couldn't, and wouldn't happen. It's not common. And it should be common that people 
see something and they do something. And especially if, and he was one of those 13 million. See, he was one of those 13 million and he took in five. So he's really helping. And just imagine if one of those five go back and so I think that's part of what the, the what the challenge is, is that often you know, people that go through the system were never. Um, I hope that you have a chance to to join us at uh, three thirty your time, four thirty our time. Um, there's an observation uh, about a that happened for me uh, during this conference uh, that I will share that I will share early on that I think will be. Um, uh, in, in a wake up calls it was for me about um, uh, recognizing how uh, how things sometimes work out and you just have no idea. Um, but that's a tease uh, for for 330. But um, it, it's just amazing. Um, you know, just recognizing that your walk will take you places. And this walk with you to Louisiana, you know, took me to a spot that I just had no idea that it would take me, but it, it, it helped. One of the things I talk to people often about is settling their spirit. It, it definitely had an opportunity to do that. And if, I, and if I had not been invited by Sharon and, and joined you, uh, what, what the, the, the experience that I had that just put uh, the last um, 40 years uh, of, of a walk in perspective by just going to one workshop and looking up one man's name and realizing how our paths crossed and I had no idea. Just put everything. So again, um, the answer is, I think the answer is in the room. Um, and we just have to keep talking and being transparent and having conversations and being courageous about those conversations. So. Um, yes. Yes, uh, Ms. Ms. Elam. Yes, I, I, I love this conversation um, and actually getting the information, what really is going on uh, out there in the system. And I think that there needs to be some type of systemic change, but also I think it starts at the legislative level uh, to, to make sure that because all of the support and resources that our family need um, really is undergird by the money, like uh, the saying, follow the money. So in order to support families in a way uh, that is meaningful, I think that um, you know, this, this document that you have here uh, for uh, systemic improvements is uh, an, an important document. I think that could be bought up and taken uh, to the legislative uh, level of um, the kinds of uh, laws that we want to see put in place so that families get this kind of support that Jarvis is actually talking about. He's saying that he was disconnected from his family for 13 years and had to rekindle that relationship and learn of people that he no longer knew anymore, right? And so when the system, you know, the, the um, when you think about uh, the support that we give families in order to keep them connected when it's absent, a lot of times the, the support and resources for that um, are absent. And so we feel as a system that our responsibility is Jarvis only. Mm. So the family system kind of gets booted out to the side, right? And that system is surviving or barely surviving or not surviving at all. And then when that youth is reintroduced into that system, it becomes tumultuous, right? Everything that Jarvis is saying, he's learning that everybody's trying to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. Um, he's trying to help his whole entire family, which should not even be for uh, a youth having gone through what he had gone through and helping, but I mean, his heart is there and and it's been a help and an assistance to his family and his you know, uh, foster mom has helped as well, but she shouldn't even be carrying that type of burden. You know what I'm saying? Right. So when they put forth legislative efforts such as uh, families first and all that kind of stuff, some language, <laughs> needs to appear in there that 
uh, includes some uh, mandates uh, within the system to work with the family around that child and to make sure that those connections are maintained because whether they are positive or negative or, you know, or maybe Jarvis or another youth may have figured out, well, this is not a good situation for me. Maybe, like he said earlier, it's better for us to grow um, in our own spaces, right? We have to give you the opportunity to make that decision. Um, and we're not giving them that opportunity when we disconnect them from uh, all that they know and their own family and heritage. So I kind of wanted to say that. I asked Sharon to unmute me because I'm really enjoying the session. But I just I felt like I needed to just share um, my thoughts on just that systemic change, you know, that paradigm shift that needs to happen so badly. And it's like shaking people. And I love that QPI uh, Quality Parenting Initiative have uh, opened the system up to a new idea of co-parenting and all of that that's happening. But what you're saying, Nathaniel, is we need some type of, um, we need to also consider uh, some aggressive action in utilizing the resources that we already have um, that um, can guide us and help us to make a almost like a movement uh, toward um, changing uh, the trajectory of the families that we interface with. Yeah, yeah, so so, so very true. And thank you so much for uh, for sharing that. Um, wow. Uh, any other thoughts? We're getting ready to, to wind down and I think Sharon's gonna want you to make sure you do your evaluation as well, but uh, any other thoughts or comments? Um, yes, I'm Laura Jones, if we can unmute her, Ms. Sharon. Got There you go, Ms. Jones. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to add to what she just said that, um, just a little story. When we adopted our daughter, um, the, the caseworker in, in the case that had been our caseworker all along, um, I asked her what we should do about navigating the relationship with our daughter's birth family. We already had a pretty good relationship with them through foster care for two and a half years. And, but none of them were gonna be able to step up and take her. And so, you know, we were the adoptive resource and we were happy and wonderfully happy to adopt her. But the caseworker said to me, you don't have to do anything with them. You don't have to communicate with them. You don't have to let her see them. You don't have to send them pictures. You don't have to do anything. Um, and I said, but shouldn't we? Shouldn't we for her sake, you know, let her keep those relationships? And, um, you know, but obviously not let her just like go stay with them or anything, but visit and invite them to her dance recitals and things like that. And the caseworker said, well, only if you want to. And so, in other words, our experience only two, two and a half years ago in North Louisiana was not much encouragement toward keeping connections. So caseworkers who are out there, you know, and foster parents and everybody, let's learn from that. Um, now, that was two and a half years ago. So, yes, we've come pretty far just in that little time. However, that really wasn't that long ago. And is that still happening? you know, where the, the connections are not encouraged to, to be kept. I realize there are a lot of different cases, a lot of different situations where that can be uh, not good or good or better or worse, you know, but we've got to try because these children, that was their life. That's their family. That's their heritage. And they need to know where they came from. They need to know that, that some of their family loves them and wants to know them and, and, know about them still you know it's so important but we weren't encouraged to do it we just did it because of things like this conferences like this and just because of our hearts you know so that was my experience well thank you thank you miss Laura, for doing that thanks for sharing anyone else yeah if you're having trouble with the mute button just let me know i'll well I want to thank um, Jarvis 
He's a treasure for our state. He's a great resource. Thank you, Jarvis, for sharing with us today. I get the comments in the chat box are really good. I'm gonna save them so I can send them to you before I close out. And I wanna thank Dr. Uh, Nathaniel Williams for being a part of this session. It was eye-opening for me. Um, and I can tell by the comments that it really touched and moved uh, some of you guys who participated in the session. And don't forget, Dr. Nate is going to do our closing session at 3.30. So uh, you guys need to come and hear that. And don't forget at the end of the day to do your daily eval for the conference. And um, the handout is available for this session on latwc.org. All the handouts that were turned in are posted there. So thank you guys. See you thank later. You. Thank you. Thank you. Brett. Thanks. Thanks, Jarvis. Yes, most definitely. <laughs>